By the summer of 1965, NASA's Project Gemini was in full swing. Gemini was the bridge between America's first space program, Project Mercury, and the still to come Project Apollo, the program that would carry men to the moon. Even as astronauts in space were fine tuning the techniques needed to complete a lunar landing, people on the ground were working on developing the hardware necessary to support Apollo's goal of landing men on the moon and returning them safely to Earth. Among those people working on the ground was Jim LeBlanc. In 1965, LeBlanc was working in NASA's Crew Systems Division as a test conductor, having recently graduated from the University of Louisiana with a degree in mechanical engineering. The Crew Systems Division had been instrumental in developing the hand controller used by Ed White during America's first spacewalk to maintain control outside the spacecraft. LeBlanc describes the role played by the Crew Systems Division in development of hardware for the Apollo program. The Crew Systems Division at that time had responsibility for the spacesuits, the, uh, and the life support system backpacks, for the environmental control systems in the, in the vehicle, the thermal control systems in the vehicle. So they had a lot of responsibility, and the branch I was in, was responsible for testing all of that hardware. In order to carry out the testing, NASA employed the use of volunteer test subjects. The volunteers were pulled from within the ranks of employees at the Manned Spacecraft Center. <laughs> In this rare, never-before-seen-in-public training video produced in 1970, Crew Systems Division employee Jack Mays, one of the first volunteer test subjects at the Manned Spacecraft Center, describes the job of the test subjects. The subjects of the Crew Systems Division at the Manned Spacecraft Center act as the human element in the testing of life-supporting equipment designed for space flight. These tests are designed to assure that these items will function properly in an actual space voyage. Most of the testing is done in vacuum chambers that reduced atmospheric pressures to simulate the hard vacuum of outer space and the lunar surface. Jim LeBlanc next explains his decision to volunteer as a test subject to play a larger role in developmental testing of Apollo hardware. I really needed some different experience to be a really top-notch test director, so I volunteered to be a test subject. An employee interested in becoming a volunteer test subject would first need permission from their supervisor. Then, the prospective test subject would need to pass an Air Force Class III physical exam. Thereafter, the candidate was required to complete an Air Force Aerospace Physiological Training course. Course instruction included vacuum chamber simulated flight and was similar to that undertaken by military pilots to qualify for flight status. Former chamber operator and volunteer test subject Tom Wilkes further describes the physiological training prospective test subjects were required to complete. When you do your physiological training, you go to 27,000 feet in the chamber, and there's several of us in there. That's the last part of your physiological training. And the whole purpose is to get your symptoms of hypoxia, lack of oxygen. Upon completion of all the requirements, the successful prospect would receive a certificate of training clearing the way for participation in testing. Jim LeBlanc further describes his decision to join the ranks of volunteer test subjects. I wanted to be inside the suit, get the feel of it, the sounds, the, the total picture, you might say, of what it was like to be inside the space suit. It was as a volunteer test subject testing an early version of the Apollo spacesuit that LeBlanc had what by all accounts should have been a fatal accident. He describes what happened. We were uh, doing the first series of Apollo spacesuit and backpack testing. Now, this was called development testing. This was early in the program. This was in 1965-66. I was the assistant test director. The test subject was going to be Jack Mays, who was a uh, very experienced test subject. He had done most of our tests during Gemini and Pablo. Anyway, he came up with a bad uh, problem with the sinuses or whatever, so he couldn't make the run. He got to looking around and decided I was about the same size as him, and I was the assistant test conductor, so I was from 
me with the procedures and just about everything that's going on, going to go on. So uh, they decided I needed to be the test subject. So this was going to be my first run as a test subject. So got all suited up, did the three R 100% oxygen free breathing, and then came down to the chamber, depressurized the chamber, started up the backpack, and then started a uh, an exercise profile. And the exercise profile was uh, was stepping up and down on a, a six inch step. We were using an eight foot chamber, which was fairly small. We didn't have we didn't have room for a treadmill or or any larger exercise type device. But as I was stepping up and down, uh, my suit hose was swinging back and forth, and eventually it blew off. And I immediately felt the suit depressurizing. I looked down at my wrist pressure gauge, which was on the left uh, forearm, and it was down to 2.5, which is as far down as it would go. Now the suit was deflated, and the weight of the backpack was pulling me backwards. So I stumbled backwards somewhat. Actually, I flipped over backwards and ended up breaking the helmet up against the door of the uh, outside lock. And just before I went unconscious, I could feel the uh, saliva on my tongue begin to bubble. When I went over backwards, people upstairs and on the consoles saw the suit pressure and immediately instructed the uh, chamber operator to start to re repress the chamber as fast as they could. With the push of a button, chamber operator Bob Clay initiated an emergency repressurization of the chamber. I came to when I heard the chamber operator call out 14,000 feet. Following the incident, LeBlanc was seen by doctors to evaluate his condition. He describes that encounter. You could see some small bubbles on my ear gum, because my ear did ache for a couple of days after that, naturally from the rapid decompression and recompression. So my ears took a pretty good beating. All that happened, no after effects, and here I am today. <laughs> The investigation that followed revealed that the hose blew off due to the use of a liquid leak detection fluid that seeped into the hose connection, thus allowing the hose seal to fail. For their rapid response in averting a disaster, test director Cliff Hess and rescue technician Hank Rotter were presented with commendations from Dr. Robert Gilruth, director of the Manned Spacecraft Center. Also receiving a commendation was Herb Sherwin, for actions he took rescuing a test subject under circumstances similar to LeBlanc's. In 1967, NASA took delivery of the first production man-rated lunar module built by the Grumman Corporation. Referred to as Lunar Test Article 8, or LTA-8, the vehicle was used to perform manned tests in conditions mimicking the vacuum and temperatures of space that an actual lunar module would encounter during an Apollo mission. In order to create those conditions, NASA had constructed a giant vacuum chamber large enough to accommodate a full-size lunar module. Chamber B, as it was known, had a 25-foot diameter and stood 26 feet high. In addition to possessing controls that could vary altitude pressure, the chamber was equipped with lights large enough to heat the chamber interior to temperatures over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. It also possessed piping along its walls that once filled with liquid nitrogen chilled the chamber to negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit. A similar but larger Chamber A was used for testing the Apollo command module. It too could be heated, cooled, and operated at full vacuum. In November 1967, astronauts Jim Irwin and John Bull were chosen by NASA managers to serve as the crew that would put the lunar module through its paces in Chamber B. In early 1968, the pair performed preliminary fit checks and ingress-egress dry runs in the chamber, but Bull was diagnosed with a medical condition that prevented him from proceeding with testing. He was replaced by Grumman pilot Gerald Gibbons. As Larry Matson recounted years later, testing proceeded through the spring of 1968. Larry Matson was an altitude test technician whose job it was to run the vacuum chamber while crews were training inside. Before working at NASA, Matson had served in the United States Air Force. 
He eventually earned a Bachelor of Science in Physics from the University of Houston in 1971. During his years at NASA, in addition to serving as an altitude test tech, he also worked as a rescue technician and volunteer test subject. He recalled an incident during which Irwin and fellow astronaut Rusty Schweigert were inside the lunar module with gloves and helmets removed. With the chamber at full vacuum and after a full day inside the lunar module, the crew inside were eager to conclude the day's testing and exit the chamber. The crew requested that the chamber be restored to half atmosphere whereupon they would employ the use of supplemental oxygen to safely exit the chamber. As the two men began making their way out, they started staggering and both passed out. At once, Matson performed an emergency repressurization of the chamber, thus allowing rescue technicians to enter and render aid to the crew. The quick response prevented tragedy. The two crew members were quickly revived and not injured. It was later determined that the astronauts had deviated from the test plan and did not know how to properly activate the supplemental oxygen. The incident was a reminder of the critical role played by these highly trained rescue techs and chamber operators. Larry Matson also played a vital role in the testing of Apollo hardware as a volunteer test subject. Beginning with Apollo 11 and continuing through Apollo 14, astronauts returning from the moon were required to remain in quarantine for 21 days for fear they might bring heretofore undiscovered lunar pathogens back to Earth. As part of the overall strategy to isolate the astronauts, NASA ordered four Airstream trailers that were highly modified to accommodate the three astronauts, a doctor, and an assistant for cleaning and cooking. Referred to as Mobile Quarantine Facilities, or MQFs, the temporary housing would be loaded aboard aircraft to transport the astronauts from their recovery vessels back to the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston. But before any crew returning from a lunar mission would use the mobile quarantine facility, it first had to be certified for manned operation. The MQFs were equipped with supplemental oxygen systems to provide air for the astronauts in the event the aircraft upon which they were being transported depressurized while in flight. An MQF was moved into Chamber A at the Space Environment Lab. Then Matson and five other test subjects loaded into the MQF and donned oxygen masks from the facility's oxygen system. Once inside, Chamber A was then pumped down to a pressure, simulating the altitude of an aircraft transporting the MQF. The tests went without incident, and the MQF's oxygen system was certified man-rated, thus clearing the way for its use. Among the various environments a volunteer test subject might work testing hardware were aircraft dubbed vomit comets. The aircraft are flown in sweeping arcs which result in several seconds of weightlessness. Depending on the flight pattern, weightlessness may last anywhere from 25 to 40 seconds. NASA had also developed a method to expose human test subjects to increased gravity loads. To do so, the volunteer test subject would ride aboard a giant centrifuge. The centrifuge was equipped with a 4,000 horsepower electric motor capable of spinning a crew inside a three-ton spherical gondola at the end of a 50-foot arm. Astronauts use terms like sadistic and torture chamber to describe the experience of taking a ride on the centrifuge. Here, volunteer test subject Tom Wilkes recounts his experience aboard the centrifuge. They'd run you up uh, on the centrifuge, start out at half a G, one, one and a half, two, and then accelerated up. Each day, they would give you a, each test, they would give you a higher, and finally, when you start tunnel vision, and that's it, you don't want to go any further. Well, in my case, and several of us, we got up to where getting over four, you're starting to feel it pretty good in your legs and ankles, and uh, you, you learn how to combat these G-forces. And that's grunt breathing and tightening your abdominal muscle. This whole process to keep this pooling of blood down in your legs and feet. You get up to four and a half or five, most of us started tunnel vision and even a couple passed out. Because if it went from tunnel vision to, to blackout, you don't really feel it or anything. You can still hear, but you, your vision goes pretty quickly. I did 10 runs in one day, starting at two and a half G's. And after 10 runs, Dr. LaPena stopped it. I hadn't tunnel vision or anything yet, but uh, it's really hard on you, and you're just wiped out at the end of the day after a test, t 10 of those, so a couple of days passed, and then the next one they're going to run up, they run it up to five and a quarter. I was still doing okay. Not many went past five. My next test, my run was for five and a half Gs. As it approached five, you can really start feeling that you're
finally, after a few seconds, my uh, tunnel vision came in, and then everything went completely black, almost within a second or two. So they immediately started slowing down and stopping the centrifuge, and that was my tolerance. Next, volunteer test subject Jim LeBlanc describes a test he participated in aboard the centrifuge for the Apollo program. I rode the centrifuge for some Apollo command module abort test, which included spikes up to 9 Gs. And during these tests, we had to verify we could reach critical control panel switches under these various G loads. They established a profile that uh, they had demonstrated an unmanned mode of a command module being ejected off of the top of the vehicle if they had an emergency on the pad. So uh, they set up the profile, got suited up in the spacesuit, and I sat in the refuge and started it up and went around and established the profile. If the crew was sitting on the pad, there would be a just one G on, the, on their backs. If they had to abort, the rocket tower attached to the command module would lift them up off of the vehicle and then the tower would come off of the vehicle. They would parachute to the ground. Now, during that activity, the G level increases as they start up and it reaches a peak of 9 Gs and then trails back off to 1 G. So it's 1 G up to 9 Gs and back to 1 G. On April 11, 1970, the crew of Apollo 13 launched from the Kennedy Space Center. Their destination, the Frau Morrow region of the moon. They would never arrive, however. During the third day of their outward bound journey from Earth, an explosion on board the spacecraft prevented the command module's fuel cells from creating the electrical power needed to sustain the vehicle's operation. With no electrical power available, the crew of Apollo 13 would eventually abandon the command module and take up residence in the lunar module for most of the remainder of their journey. With three people living aboard a vehicle designed to accommodate only two, the lunar module was quickly filling with the carbon dioxide the three men were exhaling. Test director Jim LeBlanc describes what happened in the moments following the explosion. The substance managers who were responsible for the subsystems were, were racking their brains, looking at the data, trying to find out what they really need to worry about. It became pretty clear pretty early that lithium dioxide was going to be a very limiting factor. The crew was soon running low on the round lithium hydroxide filters used to scrub the air of the carbon dioxide accumulating inside the lunar module. Without the filters, the crew would soon succumb to carbon dioxide poisoning. Because no one was living on board the command module, there was little need to scrub its air of carbon dioxide. There were plenty of lithium hydroxide filters available, therefore, from the command module. The only problem? Those filters were square, while the lunar modules were round. NASA was literally faced with the dilemma of putting a square peg into a round hole. A team from the Crew Systems Division was quickly assembled to solve this puzzle. Once again, Jim LeBlanc. When we heard about the problem, initially it was just an explosion. We didn't know what, what the end result was, what the real problem was. Our policy was when uh, there was a mission up, we had our chambers in a uh, already standby position. And what that means is we had them all, all the systems checked out we had all the consumables, oxygen, nitrogen, all the uh, supplies we needed, lithium and drug side, in fact. We had that standing by. Another member of the assembled team was Tom Wilkes. Wilkes came to work at NASA's Manned Spacecraft Center in 1964 as a logistics technician. He was promoted to altitude test technician in 1966. By the time of the Apollo 13 mission, Wilkes also served as a rescue technician and volunteer test subject. He picks up the story of the development and testing of the device conceived to help save the crew of Apollo 13. We were given a list of what we could use to build an adapter to fit the Apollo command module lithium hydroxide canisters to the uh, LEM environmental control system to scrub or take out the carbon dioxide that was being breathed by the now three crewmen in their lifeboat on the way home. The items on the list included a flight manual cover, duct tape, two suit hoses, two socks, 
bungee cord, and plastic bags. So what we did is we put this together all in a three hour time and got it ready for testing. Hours after being handed a list of items, Ed Smiley, chief of the crew systems division, his assistant Jim Coriel, and a handful of engineers and test directors had rigged a life-saving device. As the altitude test technician, it was now Wilkes' job to test the device in condition mimicking those aboard the Apollo 13 lunar module. Wilkes recounts what he did next. We started running checklists for the 11-foot chamber. The LIM ECS system was there, and it was identical to the one on the moon and on the way home that they used. The 11-foot chamber was a vacuum chamber containing a high-fidelity operational lunar module cabin complete with an environmental control system, or ECS, exactly like the one aboard the Apollo 13 lunar module. Test director Jim LeBlanc next remembers how the testing proceeded. We had the capability of injecting CO2 into the chamber at a fixed rate. And the fixed rate, in this case, would be the metabolic rate of these three people. The astronauts were calibrated before flight, so uh, their metabolic rate versus CO2 output, output was known. The test established the effectiveness of the newly developed filtration system. Soon, mission controllers radio to the crew instructions on how to assemble the device. Within 30 minutes of its completion, carbon dioxide fell to safe levels aboard the spacecraft. The problem had been successfully resolved. For their efforts, the team from the Crew Systems Division received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1970. Thirty-five years later, the team was again recognized, this time presented with Global Specs Great Moments in Engineering Award for the development of the Lithium Hydroxide Filtration System. As the Apollo 13 events unfolded, Emergency Rescue Technician and NASA Physiological Training Specialist Gene Speller waited with the rest of the world to see if the crew would return home safely. But as he watched events play out, Speller also had a personal stake in the outcome of the situation. Following a four-year stint in the United States Air Force, Gene Speller joined NASA in 1968, where he aided with bio-instrumentation for Apollo astronauts in training. It was during his years at NASA that Speller met his future wife, Martha Caballero. As it happened, Caballero was secretary to Apollo 13 commander Jim Lovell. According to Speller, Lovell had graciously offered to carry Speller's and Caballero's wedding rings in his personal preference kit, a small pouch containing mementos carried by astronauts during flight. While the couple's rings never made it to the lunar surface, they did fly around the moon and safely returned to Earth in time for the wedding in June of 1970. During preparation for the flight of Apollo 15, volunteer test subject Tom Wilkes became involved with testing of the lunar roving vehicle. The lunar roving vehicle, or LRV, was essentially a car that would be carried aboard Apollos 15, 16, and 17 and would allow the astronauts the ability to venture greater distances on the lunar surface. NASA had become increasingly concerned that following prolonged exposure to sunlight on the moon, the LRV's control handle would become too hot for an astronaut to maintain grip. An experiment was soon devised to test whether an astronaut's gloved hand would provide the needed protection from the heat. Tom Wilkes describes the test. But we'd reach in and grab the bar that was uh, a simulator for the control on the lunar rover and we would hold on to it and see if the insulation of the glove would protect us from the heat but all of us couldn't hold on it very long and uh, the test director he decided at some point he said you know maybe you don't have to just grip it like that at least two of us went up in the big circular building where the centrifuge had been and uh, it, they had put uh, sand around in a track all the way around it it was roughly a tenth of a mile i believe around it and and we were suited up yeah, we didn't have to grip it like we were doing and hold on to it. We just barely would grip it. and It was just like a joystick, just forward and left or right. So that would work fine without any modifications or any further uh, insulation in the gloves or anything. The test subjects had shown that by merely altering the way astronauts handled and manipulated the controller, there was no need to modify the glove. 
Wilkes also served as a volunteer test subject in the evaluation of a modified astronaut recovery basket used to lift astronauts from the Apollo command module following splashdown. Vance Santiampo, Tom Wilkes, and Bill Gordon are shown in the Gulf of Mexico evaluating the Billy Q basket used in the recovery of the astronauts after splashdown. The floor of a Billy Pugh basket was reconfigured so that an astronaut climbing into it would roll toward the safety of the rear of the basket. The three volunteer test subjects were selected to evaluate the effectiveness of this modification. Wilkes also became involved in testing of the Apollo Portable Life Support System's communication antenna. The Portable Life Support System, or PLIS, was the backpack worn by astronauts on the moon and contained all the hardware and consumables needed to survive while outside on the lunar surface. The PLIS also contained a communications system that allowed astronauts to converse with each other and mission controllers during lunar extravehicular activities. Here, Tom Wilkes describes the anechoic chamber where testing occurred as well as the test itself. It's a very large chamber, and of course it's not the typical like vacuum chamber. It's strictly designed to test radio transmissions uh, and different antennas, and it typically blocks out electrical magnetic uh, impulses and signals and noise, as they call it. And those pyramid cones that line the floor, the ceiling, and the walls keep that at bay. And the uh, test subject or crewman is put on this 24-foot pole as it's lowered parallel with the floor, connected at the waist, and then it's raised upwards so that it's in line with the radio signals they're pointing at the test subject. This is for communications through the PLIS backpack, but in my run, they simply tape a uh, antenna to my helmet of my spacesuit, and then they sent signals, and they got data from doing that. On my run, unfortunately, I suddenly heard a loud, high-pitched squeal, and with my helmet on and everything, there's no way I could get to it. I, I can't take my helmet off up there. I'm pressurized. I try to signal to the uh, suit tech down there, and I start a, a rapid thumbs down, thumbs down real fast, and he knows, so he orders the pole lowered, and as he comes down and they remove my helmet and gloves, they can even hear the squeal before they take the comp carrier off my head, you know. <laughs> They're afraid it's going to damage my ears, and so was I. Luckily, didn't. Uh, every, everything was okay. But the run was enough. They said they got enough data that we wouldn't have to repeat any of that. The incident helps to underscore the risks taken by volunteer test subjects in each and every test they performed. According to his colleagues, one of the most prolific volunteer test subjects for Projects Gemini and Apollo was Jack Mays. Mays came to work at the Manned Spacecraft Center in 1962 as a restraint system manager. Tom Wilkes, fellow Crew Systems Division employee, volunteer test subject, and brother-in-law to Jack Mays, remembers that Mays had volunteered to be a test subject even before NASA completed construction of its Houston headquarters. NASA had leased buildings in Houston to start their operations, and one of them was a life support building. He was a test subject even before NASA was completed. He really picked up on everything about what was going on, the uh, testing requirement. He volunteered uh, as soon as he knew about the program. He was maybe the first. I'm talking about it, uh, MSC only, not, not total NASA. But he was among the first, if he wasn't the first. Uh, he, he, when I talked to him many times over the years, he gave me the impression that he was the first, and at least in our facility, our Building 7 facility. And at some point, he and Michael Collins, the astronaut, worked together on certain projects and gained a good rapport with uh, the astronaut. They trusted his judgment. They trusted his comments and, and uh, his uh, participation as a test subject. And they learned very quickly that uh, he had a good grasp on the whole space program, especially uh, life support, which is what Crew Systems is all about. And uh, over the years, he did about every test. We're talking zero-G flights. He did centrifuge work and a lot of chamber work. 
He was testing different contractors' suits. He was testing one of the suits. You had to do certain things in the limb, bending around uh, certain consoles and equipment. And in the process, your price piece pressurized. But the bending and everything puts extra pressure on certain parts of the suit. And in one of the suits, the helmet blew off when he was bending around. <laughs> Luckily, it didn't hurt him. But that was, of course, that suit failed miserably. You can't have the helmet blowing off. <laughs> By 1968, Mays had been promoted to test director. Here, fellow test director, test subject, race car enthusiast, and close friend, Jim LeBlanc remembers Jack Mays. Jack was uh, the kind of guy who never, never met a stranger. He uh, knew a lot of people. When I first came to work at NASA, the first thing they did was take me around and show me the facilities. And one of the first people I, they introduced me to was Jack. When I had a little accident in the chamber, Jack was supposed to be the test subject. After the chamber run, I went over there because we, we usually got together and worked on stuff. He said, well, how's the run going today? I said, well, not too good. <laughs> so I told him about it. He said, well, gee, uh, why didn't they keep you an, an, under observation or something? He wouldn't let me go home. He made me sleep on his couch overnight to make sure nothing unusual happened. So that was the kind of guy he was. So prolific was Jack Mays as a volunteer test subject that NASA had made a spacesuit specifically for him. It was as a volunteer test subject that he became the model for Norman Rockwell's iconic 1966 painting, Man's First Step on the Moon. And when he passed away on December 13, 2016, flags at the Johnson Space Center were lowered to half-mast in his honor. Other men to serve as altitude test techs, rescue technicians, and volunteer test subjects included Columbus C.W. George. After serving in the Vietnam War, George came to the Johnson Space Center in 1968, where he was certified as a vacuum chamber operator, rescue technician, and volunteer test subject. Following the flights of Apollo 11 and Apollo 12, NASA set out to find a way to reduce the problem of lunar dust that adhered to spacesuits and spacecraft components. The answer came in the form of a handheld vacuum cleaner. But before astronauts could use it in space, it fell to C.W. George to test it in space-like conditions here on Earth. Test engineers coated beta material, the same material used on the outermost layer of a spacesuit, with simulated lunar dust. George then used the vacuum cleaner to remove the dust, thus demonstrating the cleaner's effectiveness. It was deployed for the first time aboard Apollo 13, but its first use came during Apollo 14. Air Force veteran Victor Murray joined the Manned Spacecraft Center in 1968. During his career, he served as an altitude test technician, volunteer test subject, chamber operator, and support diver. Murray was presented with the prestigious Silver Snoopy Award in 2018 for outstanding support to the space program during his 50-year career with NASA. In 1965, Max Candler came to the Manned Spacecraft Center, where he too became an altitude test technician and rescue tech. He served with Murray during testing and astronaut training for the Apollo Soyuz project. Following a four-year stint with the United States Air Force, future altitude test technician and volunteer test subject Richard Hermling joined the Manned Spacecraft Center in 1966. As a test subject, Hermling became involved with testing of the Apollo Spacesuit and Portable Life Support System, or PLIS. The objective of the tests was to qualify the suit and PLIS for a worst-case scenario on the moon that is, being inside a lunar crater during a lunar day. In order to complete the tests, Hermling would first be fitted with sensors to monitor his physical condition. Then he would don the suit and pliss before entering vacuum chamber A, surrounded by high-intensity carbon arc lights used to simulate the heat of the lunar surface. Once inside the chamber, and after the chamber had reached a desired temperature, Hermling began an exercise regimen designed to raise his body temperature. 
He would then use the Pliss cooling system to maintain a comfortable environment inside the spacesuit. The testing was a success and revealed several shortcomings with the spacesuit and Pliss, including difficulty reaching controls on the Pliss and the surface of the helmet blistering under the intense lights. The problems uncovered by the testing led to modifications in both the suit and Pliss and aided in preventing trouble for astronauts on the lunar surface. Richard Hermling also served as a rescue technician during man tests inside a vacuum chamber. In 1966, he was commended by the head of the Manned Spacecraft Center, Dr. Robert Gilruth, for two separate occurrences during which his quick responses as a rescue tech prevented injury of imperiled volunteer test subjects. Ken Desert began work at the Manned Spacecraft Center Space Environment Simulation Lab in 1966 before being promoted to systems engineer in 1968. Following the Apollo 1 fire in January 1967, the use of 100% oxygen environments for manned tests was suspended. Desert participated in the redesign of the ground test environmental control system necessitated by the suspended use of 100% oxygen. Then, in March 1968, he was selected to serve as a volunteer test subject to re-establish 100% oxygen use in new spacesuits developed after the Apollo 1 fire and more broadly across all of NASA. Desert completed testing on March 28, 1968 inside Chamber B. The testing was a success and full use of 100% oxygen was resumed. For his contribution to the manned space program, Ken Desert received a letter of commendation from Chief Astronaut Alan Shepard. And Desert was presented with the prestigious Silver Snoopy Award by astronaut Michael Collins. The Silver Snoopy was given for professionalism, dedication, and outstanding support that greatly enhanced spaceflight safety and mission success. The Silver Snoopy itself actually flew to the moon aboard Apollo 10. Navy veteran Charlie Pate came to the Manned Spacecraft Center in 1965. He worked as an altitude test technician in the Crew Systems Division. Pate also served as a rescue technician before leaving NASA in 1973. After leaving the Air Force in 1967, Bill Gordon joined the Manned Spacecraft Center later that year as an altitude test technician. He served as a chamber operator in support of the thermal glove tests performed ahead of the flight of Apollo 15. Charles Dak Dukowski supported training of air crews and support groups on the effects of altitude exposure during his four years in the Air Force. He also provided water and land survival training, as well as ejection seat operations training. When he left the Air Force in 1965, he joined the Manned Spacecraft Center as an altitude test technician. By the time he retired in 2006, Dukowski had been manager of the Space Environment Simulation Department of the Crew and Thermal Systems Division. Vince Senatiempo served four years in the United States Marine Corps before coming to the Manned Spacecraft Center in 1963 as a logistics technician. Following the near drowning of Mercury astronaut Gus Grissom when his spacecraft sank after splashdown, NASA examined new neck dam designs for Apollo spacesuits. Neck dams were designed to prevent water from entering the spacesuit. As a volunteer test subject, it was Senatiempo's job to test those new designs as part of the overall development of the Apollo spacesuits. By the time Senatiempo left NASA in 1979, he had been elevated to lead technician of the Chamber Operations Group. Bob Haas came to work at the Manned Spacecraft Center in 1968, where he served as an altitude test technician before leaving NASA in 1971 to become an air traffic controller. Kirby Dupree served as supervisor of the Crew Systems Division's Water Immersion Facility, the large facility used in training to simulate the weightlessness of space. On February 29, 1972, Dupree was assisting diving instructor James Scott when a box containing batteries exploded, taking Dupree's life. Kirby Dupree was 31 years old. During the making of this video, 
It occurred to me that the people who served in the crew systems division did so as a closely knit team, almost like family. Many of the recollections and much of the materials were furnished by two men who were part of that close-knit group. I wish to thank my good friends Tom Wilkes and Jim LeBlanc for the hours they spent with me recalling those early days, sharing stories of the work and people of the Crew Systems Division. Many thanks to them both.